Hallo Asik, <laughs> welkom to my podcast. Hallo Chris. So we are in Farm again and my little studio gallery. Vasek is, uh, I'm speaking to Vasek, but to Sek today, a local legend. He's been living on the same farm for 20 years. Vasek, first of all, tell me a little bit about your history, where you grew up and how you got to South Africa. Well, thanks first that you are willing to do something like this, Chris. Pleasure. It's an honor. Cheers. Well, usually when people ask me, where do you come from? You know, because my accent is just totally different. I always say I was born in Prague. I come from Czech Republic, which used to be Czechoslovakia. But I wasn't actually born in Prague. I was born about 20 kilometers from Prague. But it's much easier to say Prague because at least lots of people know Prague, but nobody would know if I would say the name of the village I was born. You know? Yeah, and we moved soon out of that village. I was born in 1943, so that's last two years of the Second World War. I only moved to Prague, actually. I grew up. I've stayed in Prague till about 1718. When do we do our uh, maturity, what we call, at 18? So I studied in, in Prague, in school. I always like painting. I always thought I'm going to be a painter. And I probably was born painter. You know, but anyway, we had a, across the road, there was a small little shop. They mainly just cut glass, but now and then somebody would exhibit a painting behind it and I would run across the bridge, flat my nose on that glass you know, and look at this beautiful painting. Most of the time it was flowers or landscapes. Oh, oh one day. One day, I'm going to paint just like this. Oh, since a small boy, you wanted to paint? Huh? Yeah, since a small boy. Can I ask you something before we continue? Every now and then, I'm just going to ask something when it fits into the mm. narrative. What is the politics of Prague in those days? We were a communistic country okay. under the rule of Russia after the Second World War, obviously. We basically became the satellite state of Russia. So you grew up under communism? Yeah, under okay, communism. Okay. And I had a buddy in a school Funny his name, actually. If I should translate it into English, it was a person who eats meat. His name was Maso, which is meat. Yidek, Maso Yidek, and Yid is to eat. So he was Maso Yidek. And he was like, big, guy. big little boy. And we often went, they lived in a very big house with big attic. And we often went there to play up there. Scratch it with his junk. There was so much junk, you can't believe it. And I found a painting. It was a pine forest. So I remember it yesterday. Some of the trees were cut, they were lying over the road. That, you know, really In the painting. How old were you then? Huh? How old were you then? What was I? 12? Okay. Sure. Oh, God, I was fascinated by it. And it was painted by a Russian artist who actually is very famous, or was very famous those days. His name was Chepikin. And I started painting landscapes. Bicycle, strapped my little easel on it, I had a lovely little folder where you could put shift your canvas in so it didn't get smudged when you open it. And out of town and I would forever paint outside. You know. Self taught teaching yourself how to go as you go, did you have yeah. lessons? Of course in school we we had a kind of an art lesson. Um, on a quite a wide scale, you know. So I always wanted to be the best, and I was the best. Mm-hmm. So you had a natural gift of just drawing. Yeah. So of course I made up my mind. Okay, I'm going to study for art on Prague Academy, yeah. and then everything started to turn into a nightmare. In the year before, no, I would be actually lying. So I applied for the, for the exams. They took four days. And the choice was very, very strict. From 80 applicants, they would only take four people per semester. So you really, they had to be good. And I haven't done it. So I decided to go and work with my dad for one year. That at least bring a little bit of money home. <coughs> a year later, I went to do this examination again. 
in that year, there was a countrywide competition in my category, and I won a first prize. So you can imagine, I thought, wow, now, you know. Wow. I will do the exam. In the whole country, the, the first prize. Yeah, in the whole country. And the category is, what, is it landscapes? Or what it um, I can't remember, Chris, but oh. it was my age wow. category. Okay, so yeah, there was like from 12 to 15, it's from 15 further, you know what I mean? Super, so you're so number one in the country. Eh? The road is open. Yeah. You won't believe it. I haven't done the examination again. Do you think there was politics involved? Of course it was politics. Like the same auto. Because my father was not a member of the Communist Party. Mm. And for children, their parents were not with the regime. It was impossible to go and study. The doors closed. Yeah. So but you, did, you, you knew you have to do this. Now you yeah. knew you were good. Yeah. So you see, when I came back, my art teacher actually realized there is something very fishy going on. So he made a big write-up in the newspaper. How is it possible that people who award a first prize to a child, that were the same people in art school, suddenly won't let him to finish the examination? Yeah. And they realized... They made a boo-boo. So they offered me immediately another post, another school, without any exams. But that school was more towards jewelry design and jewelry making, and I didn't want it. Yeah. So I thought, you know what? Just shove it. So the, 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 that that was saying that it shove yeah. it was already yeah. there from the no. beginning. Just shove it. <laughs> One day I will do it anyway. And from then, I did all sorts of things. I would work in small little factory, we did work with Perspex, cut little stands for photographs, a little like uh, holders for wine glasses. And it was again, it was creative. I was doing window dressing. I was a lifesaver on a public swimming pool and I could hardly swim myself, not that I can actually rescue somebody. <laughs> I think I had the shortest job from most of people. I was employed for one night. I was a night watchman in a Prague zoo with a gun and a torch. A real gun? Yeah, a real gun. Jesus. And walking, or unless there were these things, they put animals to sleep. You know? Oh, yes. And I had to walk three times during the night or four times check if the gates are closed, if the lions and the leopards and all these hyenas and everything is fine. And the next morning I resign. Yeah. Why? Oh my God, how can I walk through the night looking animals, you know, you shine oh, yeah. torches uh, and they're like, hey, what, the, what the hell is going on, you know? You want to job. sleep, you yeah. live alone. And so it's a horrible job. Uh, not just, it's not added natural security. And I uh, went to a swimming pool one day. We have this big river um, that's even is celebrated in uh, Czech composer Antonin Dvořák that calls Moldava and he composed a music. How the river starts from small little stream and going towards the Prague and end up up in the sea. <coughs> Anyway, these little swimming pools, they were like in that river, like on a wooden plateaus, you know, with different depth of the basins where you could swim, one meter ten, one meter twenty, two meters, three meters. And it was kind of an overcast day, so five minutes was sunshine, next five minutes started to rain, then again sunshine, and always when it started to rain, people, everybody picked up the towel and ran under the little roof, Waiting, oh, it stopped, they all came back again, put the tongue down, sat in again. And I met a beautiful girl. Her name was, or is still, Magdalena Molinari. And in those days, the fashion was these false hair pieces, you know. And I look at this chick, and he goes to one of the pools, goes, chup, took, took out those pits, uh, took the hair piece, put that next to the swimming pool. Jive dived in and swam a little bit and get out, still wipes the water out of the face, hair like this, pick up the thing again. The spins were here on her shoulder strap on the bra, go tip, 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 and then she was beautiful again. She started walking. I started giggling and she stopped next to me. She said, You find it funny? 
I said, no, no, that's funny. I could see there's a herpes, but I mean, who would do that? She said, oh, well, I'll do anything I want, she says. And so we start chatting and chatting and chatting. Two hours later comes the question, can you ice skate like me? Well, everybody can ask it, but... Did you ask her? Does she ask no, you? she asked she me. Asked you. Oh, yeah. okay. Because she actually said, I'm an ice skater. Ah, okay. Check, ice shower, you know, I skate yeah. for a living. So she said to me, can you ask it? I said, yeah, I can ask it quite well. Said, because we are short of guys. Don't you want to come tomorrow, you know, and show what you can, how can you skate? Maybe they take you. So I said, you have a deal. Next so time. I'm assuming everybody skated there in your country because yeah, of winter. Yeah, that's a winter sport. You grow up with skating. Okay, anyway. Yeah. So I went the next day, show them I could turn and twist and do a little pirouette and a little jump at them. Yeah, okay, so you have a job. Just like that? Just like that. Nice. So I became an ice skater. Okay. We did like a shower's uh, crystal something, I couldn't remember, blah, blah, blah. And we traveled to Poland once a year, to Bulgaria, all the other communist countries, just not to the West. And then I was about 18. The first call came to the army. I said, army, oh, no way. I will never, ever go to army. I rather slit my throat, but I'm not going to army. So can I just ask something, when you were scared, yeah. did you continue doing art or did you like put that shot? No, I left it. Left it for a while. I okay. suddenly had fun and, you know, nice girls and good job and you know, I forget about it's good it. It's good to get it. Totally. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, then comes like news that there used to be, and she is still very famous, a Peruvian singer, Emma Sumac who had the widest voice range from the deepest uh, tone to the highest. Peruvian. Oh, Peruvian. Okay. And then is Emma Suma. So she was famous, world famous. Oh, she was world famous. Yeah. And she came to Prague to do a performance. That morning we had rehearsals. I had my papers for the army. So after rehearsals, we go to the dressing room. I take my boot off, I give it to Magdalena. We became very good buddies. I said, I hold my leg like this, hit me. So you had to go to the army, no choice? I had to go to the army for Jeez. two years. I said, hit me. She said, are you sure? I said, Magda, just fucking hit me. And she, very my knee. On your knee? And you could just look at the knee, it was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Just want to get out of To the, the doctor, they put my leg in a plaster from ankle right up to here for seven weeks. So I didn't have to go to the church in the army. <laughs> By the same evening, I was sitting in that new hall and watching Ima Sumak singing. It was an amazing experience. So again... But no ice skating then for you as well, because you'd like it. No ice skating, that's fine. I watched the rehearsals and, you know, seven weeks and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Started skating again. Yeah. So you, you skipped the army, you got out of it? No, I didn't. The next year, the call came to army again. No, I went. Somewhere far into Slovakia, it was a nightmare, actually. They took us there with this big truck, opened a big barn full of straw. The truck shined the lights in. They throw over your head an empty sack that you did had to stuff that was your bed. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that was your bed for two years. You kept on stuffing it more and more and more and more. A straw. A straw. straw bag. But yeah. that thick and it had to be square. See? So in the corners we pulled down sticks. That is like really 90 degrees, you know. So I was for two years in the army. Actually, I was there for 26 months. But what unit were you? You, mm -hmm. you were the... Nice. I was with the, uh, uh, what you call it, a fly. The parachute you told me, I think. Uh, yeah. Air Force? Air Force. I was at the Air Force. Okay. But I was a parachute. That's a tough, was that a tough year? <coughs> no, 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 not really. Okay. <coughs> the because training. You know, in Africa, if you have a parachute, you need to squat it. The training was tough. Oh. But after the first year, everything settles down because the new recruits come 
and they get fucked up, yeah. as we did the year before. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't use the word fucked up. No, we can, in this podcast, we, we swear if we want yeah. to swear at us. But uh, was, it, uh, was it for you, uh, was it a, a good or bad experience or mixed experience at Army? Did it change you for a long time? The bigger increase was, I thought I'm going to really kill myself. Yeah. The way they handle you, it was like not even human, you know. I tried anything possible. I would wet my long jumps, which was like together thing with the top, and the, I would go under cold shower in winter and wet it, totally wet. And I would sit outside in winter till it froze on me. Yes. I wanted to die. Yeah. But this is how I get to know you are very... Uh, one track mind when you get into something and you're very resolute when you decide something you like you're very motivated I didn't even have a sniff the bloody next day you no, know it, so like, it just didn't work things were odds were against me then I was given an order to make a fire on a barracks I didn't know where is a chopper I didn't know where is a wood no nothing and I had a pair of scissors in my rucksack so I took the scissors I said, okay, and, and I wanted to blind myself. So Jeez. I plucked the scissors, but I just missed it. It went past the eyeball there, and I just started running. So you actually went to blind yourself in yeah. one eye? I just started yeah. running and running and running, and then I don't know. And I woke up the next day, I was in the hospital. Yeah. It, you must have been very unhappy. Yeah, I was probably, I had a nervous breakdown. Yeah, probably. So you had that sensitive type of uh, thing always? Yeah. I was always like a small, you know. You know, like they probably sensitive. gave me some sedatives. I just passed away. You know. Then they transferred me to a, a real big army hospital, you know. And I did one wrong thing. I didn't do many of them in my life, but I did, and I conf find to the doctor that I'm gay. Okay, so that time it was obviously terrible. And then the nightmare started. Then people went after you. I was in a room with a bed, with a wire on, no handles, nothing, no spoons, no knives, no shoelaces, nothing. And every second day, nurse would come, Injection, gave you a bucket, and you went to a cinema, and they showed you pornographic films. So they tried to turn you, and you just vomited, and oh, vomited. That's and horrible. Vomited, eh? and vomited. So then, when did you know that you were gay? Uh, from what age? Or did you always just know? Did you always like? Maybe that could be a story if people like it to another podcast. Okay, because it's interesting yeah. because I'm wondering this, yeah. this that you try to blind yourself if the if the that the secret you kept was maybe contributed to this crisis that you said well I'm, that made you sad yeah. and then when it, when you confess maybe that you were gay you were released from that pressure yeah. kind of yeah. I was just wondering to tie that in yeah. okay but we, yeah. yeah no that would be actually a chapter on its own yeah well, well, you got lots of stories yeah. <laughs> I don't know how. Long do you want to make this? Ah, uh, there's no rules. Uh, more or less, uh, I'll be. Because but when I came back from army, yeah. you know, suddenly there were no friends around me, because in that time, in those two years, they closed the Czech ice show, yeah. and all my friends went somewhere to another ice shows. Most of them to Germany, England, because. We were like cheap label as the Yugoslavian people are. You're skipping to forehead now, this is the important part. Yeah. That what they showed you pornography, they yeah. tried to force to turn you. Yeah. And what happened there? Did yeah. you just play along or did you just say, fuck wait, you? Wait, 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 what? Oh, you skipped the part where they said you, you admitted that you were gay and they showed you this pornographic films. Yeah. How long did that last? Uh, good two months. Sure. And then you died just what then? Then they sent me back to the army camp with a report from a doctor. Luckily enough for me, there were two buddies of mine, they came to fetch me with the guns and everything. Oh. Thank God I didn't have the handcuffs, you know. We opened the letter, we wrote the report and all oh, what they put in, that I'm homosexual and if things are not going to go in a good way, they can use a force. 
Ja, richtig. Ja. Das no gut. compassion. Ja. But soon after that, I was transferred from the original place in Slovakia to Prague. So when I was in Prague, I started the film for much, much better. Oh, yeah. I think it gets out of that horrible situation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you finished all, all your thing. You had to finish two years. I actually even did two months more afterwards. Because if you did another two months, they didn't call you for training for the next five years. If you didn't, oh. you would go every year for training. Every year. So I've been here 24 already. Another two months is nothing. I had the canteen. I was selling boys cigarettes and cokes and this and that and that. You know, that went quickly. Yeah. But two months was nothing. It must have made you angry, though, the way they treated you. I mean, there must have been a lot of anger. You know. I would have been it's, pissed off. It's difficult to actually say what it made me. Because it is a long time ago. Oh, yeah. You know, and also when you are young, you you think otherwise than I think now. I did had to go through it, mm. otherwise I wouldn't. And you just have to deal with it. And it's the past. Yeah. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. After the army. Yeah, and after the army, as I said, no friends. Actually, the lady who was in our office, her name was Hannah. She could speak lots of languages. Said, I said, don't worry. We will write to the English company, Holiday on Ice. We will write to the Deutsches Astheater, Germany. Maybe there's a space for you. So she wrote two letters, one to the England, they were full. And in Germany, West Germany, wow, was the space. Like Holiday on Ice, so this is a company. Holiday on Ice was English company. Okay. Yeah, they had two companies actually. Okay, there was another one in Austria, Wiener Ice Review, it called. But there was one in Germany that called Deutsches Ice Theater. And most of my friends were actually with that company. But you had obviously had a natural talent for ice skating. Mm, so I skated good. very well, actually, yeah. yeah. So, from one day to another, chuk chuk train, and I was in Germany. Like Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> Much better, eh? <laughs> Suddenly, your life is good again. And, Believe. No. But so you could get out of, oh, but that was obviously the, the communist part of Germany. Yeah. Yes. And you know what was funny? In that little coupe in the train was a girl opposite to me. After a while, her name is Katya. After a while, we find out that we're both going to skate for the same company. And I'm friend with her till now. Wow. It's amazing. Uh, she stayed in, she was in South Africa for a couple of years. She married a chap from Johannesburg. She came to live here, but after the Velvet Revolution 1965, when there was a restitution in Czech Republic and it became only Czech Republic, she went back. Well, you were saying that this podcast is linking and you say, hello, Katja. Yeah. Katja. Katja Dirtlips. <laughs> nice, great. Okay, cool. Yeah. So then you went to Germany? And I went to Germany and I started to skate there, which was like, pity people don't understand my language, but the, sometimes the description of situation really sound the best in my language. Okay. You know, it was like, wow. Anyway. Okay, so in Germany, the ice skating company and uh, life, life is good. That was absolutely amazing. How old were you then? Like 20s? I was there, well, no, I, was, I came back from army, I was 22. I was probably in Prague for about at least a year and a half, 23, I think about 24, 24 something. Okay, like. that's a good time of life. Yeah, 24, right? because I was there for six years, and when I was 30, I came to South Africa. Okay. Yeah, six years. Did you do six years in that company, the ice skating company? Mm -hmm. Did you do six years ice skating in that company? Yeah. Must have been wonderful. It was fantastic. I wish that every young person can have that kind of action youth as I had. Nothing to worry. Look beautiful every night with beautiful costumes, you know. People clapping you. Look beautiful during the day because all what you did, you shop for new clothes. They paid quite well. You went to a restaurant for coffee, cakes, dinners. And at night to a nightclub. And travel, see the yeah. world. And travel for free. See the world. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Uh, you finished the ice show. It, it was tough. We had lots of shows. Okay, we had Monday one, Tuesday one, Wednesday two. 
Thursday 1, Friday 3, Saturday 3, and Sunday 3. You must become good if you have so many shows. Right? Yeah, we had, well, what did we have? 3, 6, 9, 10, 11, 12, 12 or 13 shows a week. Yeah. So you actually, when you had three shows, you were in the ice rink already at like half past one, hour before the show, and you left 12 o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. Uh, parties, I'm assuming you had lots of parties. We never had supper before. You can't really skate well with full stomach. Uh-huh. Then you go for dinner, and then you hit the nightclub. And you come home, four o'clock in the morning. No, that was a good time in Germany. Absolutely. They say often that the grass is greener on the other side. But it is true. The grass was greener on the other side. You could hardly buy anything by us. Oh, yeah, the difference between you and German, communist Germany, there was a big difference. If you saw a queue somewhere in vegetable shop, you knew they had potatoes, you stand queue. There you could buy banana at 12 o'clock at night on a corner cafe. Yeah. yeah. That's why when my mother came to visit me, I mean, she was just like, she could, she could have a heart attack any, any minute. Yeah. So banana was kind of an exotic thing there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, your, the, the way you grew up then in Prague, so it was very simple life, very simple food, basic stuff. Mm. Okay. Very basic. Yeah. But anyway. As I said, the job was wonderful, they paid well. What they also did that in an interval between the first half and second half, they quickly uh, sprayed the ice with them, not spray, we sprayed it here, but they had that ice machine, what they call They flattened it nicely, quickly, so it was fresh new ice. Okay. And then big uh, clothing shops and clothing businesses would have more the show. I don't have to translate it. More the is a fashion. Yeah. fashion. Fashion show. Fashion show. Okay. Yeah, on cat- ice. On ice. You know, like a catwalk, this would be on ice. And you would perform around us. Yeah, so they would always have about, choose about five, six girls, all depend how many items they had to show, three, four guys. For that, you did get paid extra. And after, say, the three weeks of that, you could buy those clothes for half a price. Interesting. Yeah. This is what I want to ask you. I didn't know, it. like fashion that existed in a communist part of the world. No, not by us. I know it did. It did. did. Yeah. And, and how did you young people feel growing up in a communism then about the West? Did you, did you want to go there? Did you feel like uh, you're missing out? Because you don't know something else, you don't miss it. Uh, so you didn't miss it, you didn't think about no, it. No. You just went out of your lives. Yeah. And you had fashion shows, but out of Germany. Yeah. Okay. You know, the only thing that the girls did miss was a pantyhose. <laughs> so did because, because like we would, would have pantyhose in a shop, like you could only buy one pair. Oh, and okay. they would soon have a hose. They could get a pantyhose out of an automat on the wall, you know. Oh, throw a few coins in a new pantyhose. You never bothered to actually stitch them or put a nail varnish on that leather eye that it was running down. You know, so that, but did you, did you get info, info from the rest of the world, information? And Very seldom. Really? Very seldom. So you didn't know what you were missing anyway? Yeah, as far as uh, press, you know, magazines, that was all diverted to the Russian side, most of the information, the music, it was all controlled in a way, all controlled. So you, you guys never felt like, oh, I wish I could go to New York or something? Ah, no, no. You could only dream about dream. it. Dream, yeah. You know, first of all, money, you know, you hardly... And movies, did you get international movies? No, oh, not really. Uh, I was so very much Russian. Russian, okay. All the time, yeah. 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 Okay. Like almost education. They were brainwashing you constantly, you know, constantly. For the country. Everything is done for the country. Uh. You know. But if you had some friends in a tobacco shop or a newspaper shop, he would keep the Time magazine under the counter for you. Uh. So it's not that everybody was like blind, you know, and that people talk together. We were not like walking with uh, blinkers on our eyes. We did not, and, and also, people talk, obviously. Yeah. People talk. Yeah. Uh, but uh, 
being, do you think being a gay man that time in communism was especially hard? Was it frowned upon, looked down onto because, or was it, how was that? Did you have any lovers in that time when you were young? It was, what was it really? Could you be open about it? No. Not at all? No, no, no. Was not open. So if I was born uh, 43, 53 plus 8 is 61. The law came through 1961. That it's now fine. Okay. Because I had a friend who was in a government. He was the main pusher. He was actually my lover. An older man, much older man than me. And he was pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And he gave me the certificate of it for my 18 years birthday. Wow. That from now on, it's the fine. police can just bust you, you know, whenever they feel like. But they carried on anyway. No, it's mean, prejudice like this. Yeah. This country is also, yeah. to me, I grew up as well, uh, on an African, it's almost like mafia. Yeah. Like. Most of this life was underground. Mm. It was always underground. I see a lot of my friends uh, and a lot of artists Okay, I mean, I see they, they have trauma. They're still struggling with the trauma of being persecuted for who they were, you know. Um, I'm a straight man, I don't understand it, but I can kind of understand it because even when I grew up in Afrikaners, they were always, are you not allowed to speak about it? You're not allowed to be that. It was terrible. The world changed so much. And I think growing up of being persecuted just for who you are, that trauma, I think for many people, it never goes away. Yeah. I can stop. I can see some of my friends, one of the people still struggling with those issues. Uh, but then luckily, we're in an era now where that is like gone. I don't think I made myself a big headache about it. In a way, I had a relationship with any sex. Yeah. Till about what? Till I came to South Africa. But you also not, you don't have a victim mentality. You have a yeah. strong going forward mentality. Yeah. Like we slept, yeah. I slept with Magda since I met her. Oh. You know, and with other girls too. One is young. You get your rocks off. Yeah. And there's a chance to get your rocks off. So that was also going on all the time. Yeah. That part, yeah. mm-hmm. All the time. Oh. And uh, at this stage, you, you not, I know you don't use any alcohol. Uh, that, when you were young, did you drink also? And I never drank really because my father did like a little bit of booze. And it always created troubles in our family. And I like, gave myself this thing. You never oh. ever drink. I never drink. Because we also always get this picture, like, especially people from Eastern Europe, they drink a lot. Uh, you know, the movies also portray as hard drinkers, Russians. But I'm thinking, like, because our lives are hard, and it's the same in this country, you see the farm workers and they have hard lives to drink more because you have to get through it. Yeah. Uh, so, so, was that part of the culture in general that people drink a lot? You know, if I would go deeper into my childhood and the way I grew up, I could talk for hours and hours. Yeah. And hours I'm like racing now. It's just not that. Yeah. It's just like now that I'm telling you things, it's like there's Coming up. so much. There's just so much. We're going to have a sick part one, two, three, yeah, four. Is, <laughs> so much. Okay, let's go on. Beside, I'm going to get to the part where you got into Africa. Wow. How did this idea come to you that you want to uh, come to Africa? Didn't. It was in a way almost like what did, what did, what did you say? I had no other choice. Uh, yeah. did, you, did you dream about Africa? There you was only, I had choice. I could either go to uh, South Africa or I could go to Australia. But why, why, why does the country? I'll tell you now, because skating in Germany was wonderful. Yes. Funny how you actually come to the true years and years and years later. And I really came to the true a couple of months ago. Anyway, because I had this reoccurring dream that I'm back in the art show and they don't want me anymore, you know. And I kept on saying, every time I had a dream, I said, why, you know, why, why do I keep on dreaming about it? But to actually tell you what happened, I eventually was fired from that company. So when I was fired, I had to return home in 24 hours. Luckily enough. I always had these women goddesses, they took care of me, you know, when I was really down in a gutter. But why did you get fired? I did get fired because I kept on, I didn't have my mouth closed and say yes and yes and yes and yes and yes. 
because we had, there was quite a number of Czech people. There was good 15 up to 20 Czech people. So what we had, uh, we had an older person who helped with the language. He helped from the beginning. His son also skated in that show. His name was Boris Millet. He made, now what he did, he used to write reports about us. How do we behave? We have to the walk the line. That would go back to Prague, to the agency that made possible the contract between the German agency, that called Prague of Sport. And if we were write anything bad about you, or just say, I don't want this person anymore, you didn't get out again. Politics again. Once a year you went home for holiday for one month. A lot of people use that power, I'm assuming. So that was the politics. Right. So he actually yeah. fired me. Yeah. So you write something. The uh, a guy who, in a way, uh, owed the Asha came to me and said, look, Vashak, I'm really sorry. Because it, but you know where it comes from. So it was a personal thing? Yeah, it was a personal thing. So I said, look, it's fine, Mr. Schilling. I know where it comes from. Yeah. I washed my makeup off. But was it must have came as a bit of a shock, though. You see, they told me before the show started, they came and they asked me, Vashek, in an interval, you must go to the office. There is some, they want to tell you something. And I could feel it, what it is. So I said, now I go now. I have five minutes now. So I went to the office. There was Mr. Millet sitting, Mr. Schilling sitting, and Mr. Millet said, you're fired. Must have been a... Okay. Are you going to skate the show? I said, no, of course not. Came back to the dressing room, took my first costume off, washed my face, put my clothes on, went to the audience to watch the show. Which was all fun, there was entertainment. The next morning, it hit at me. Now, I became the little communistic boy growing up. Fun. Now I have 24 hours to go home. So that was the law, 24 hours? 24 hours. Otherwise, I'm going to be police, with police escorted back home. And you have to leave this life what behind? You, like it? you know what you like it. I didn't risk, we didn't have to save. We were paid every week. I hardly had any money. But I stayed with the most amazing woman in a small pension. I told her what happened. She went to beg for me to the ice shop. They said, no way. You must go home. And Anna said, no, you're not going home. Stay with me. Stay with me. I'll take care of you. Okay. You know, no problem. So I stayed over a month and a half in one small room. Okay, I illegally. Had, illegally. Okay. Okay, I had access to the whole house. We were watching TV. She fed me. You know everything. It was during the winter over Christmas. Every doorbell down at the bottom. I thought that's the police now. You know. Then Hannah said, "Vashik, you have to get some fresh air. Come, I'll take you out for drive to no man's land." which is a 100 meter stretch used to be between Holland and Germany. And nothing can happen to you on that line. They're going to arrest you. So she would drive her car on the yard. I would lie on the back seat. I would insist for her to cover me with a blanket. And she covered it like it was a package line. And if we drove to Norman's land, they would go for walks. Then back to the car, how we went. It's a bit of freedom. And it was like crazy. Sure, you know. that's strange. Yeah. So there's no rules there. No. Interesting. And I went to South African uh, uh, embassy in Köln with night train, spoke to the ambassador, he looked at my passport, he said, I'm sorry, Mr. So-and-so, but the only way you can actually, what, or the only thing you can do is to emigrate. Okay, so then you, we tried to go back home when I caught you. If I would go back home, yeah. I don't really know what they could do nothing to me, really, you yeah. know. But I didn't want to go back home, what do Then I made up my mind, I don't want to go back home. Okay. At all. And your family ties? Just, well, to say this, this is life. This is my life. Yeah. I spoke to my mom about it. She said, You must do what you decide to do, is the best for you. So you made a quick decision. We will all miss you, but you must do, you must look out yourself. So if you have the chance, go. Okay. Yeah. So there's a quick decision. 
But in the meantime, there were some, I kept contact with the Asha because there were also a few kids from South Africa. And Bernie, the girl from Johannesburg, said, Vasek, we have Asha in South Africa. I'm going to write a letter to this lady. We'll see if we can get you a job. Okay? She wrote. Answer so came back from Marjorie Chase from Durban. She gave me a contract for five years. So at least now I was sitting with something in my hand, still in that one room, okay? And I knew that I can go to South Africa. But what did you think about South Africa at that time? What was the view that in your head? Because there must have been a lot of politics and propaganda. About I didn't know about nothing about didn't it. didn't know anything. Okay. No. And what the kids told me, it was like in Europe, shopping malls and all that kind of stuff, you know. That's interesting that it's African, sorry, this is an interesting South Africans were actually yeah. in West Germany ice skating. That for me is interesting. Yeah, yeah, they were there. Yeah, okay. Well, that's another story also. Yeah, anyway, I needed to take my passport, the contract, yeah. send it to South African embassy in Pretoria, and then I was waiting. I don't know how long it took, say two, three weeks, and one morning. Anna is knocking on my door. Vasek, 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 there's a letter from Pretoria. Mm-hmm. Open it. There, we open it. Of course, all in English. I couldn't speak a word of English. Nothing. No, no. You do it. Call a friend who spoke English. Come, Maria, come. Translate for us. They gave me visa for six months. Okay. That was your in? No, I could go. Without well, speaking a word of English. No. But I had not a cent. Yeah, how, how do you get there? I mean, how will I get there? And of course, this lady became to know me just like my mom. She said, I know you don't have money, my darling, but leave everything to me. Sure, yeah, she's an angel, eh? She, was, she angel. was. She went to town, she came back with a ticket. You are flying tonight, half past nine. Just like that. Oh, fuck. <laughs> so you must have I'm been excited. Back. No, but did you ever, you had a place to stay on the other side or yeah. that? Okay. So, yeah. Back. I had two suitcases. She took me to the airport in Frankfurt, put my suitcases through, come and say final goodbye to Hannah. And she said again, why are you so miserable? Come on, you know, new life is starting. I said, you know, but you must have some money, it's a little bit. I gave you some pocket money. I said, yeah, but I had two suitcases and like I had to pay for extra weight. How about what you have in those suitcases? I said, well, my things in high boots. He said, you don't need them. You need T-shirts <laughs> and floppies. In South Africa, it's warm. <laughs> she went, they sent the suitcases back. She opened it like this, packed me one suitcase, closed the other and said, it's with me. If you need it, phone, write it, I'll send it to you. You think you're going to get cold in South Africa? There is a suitcase and go. No, off I went. I sit in the plane. That was just, it was very different, 1972. You could they, smoke in the place and then they... Yeah, you could smoke and only they start entertainment when you were up music. And then there was a main film somewhere down there, you know, do you remember? And the first piece of music they played was from Antonin Dvořák, which he wrote in New York in assignment, My Country. And I just started wow. Let it cry. No, you leave your country. Yeah, the yeah. lights were down there, were getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Oh, yeah. Then I watched some movies. On your own, you then know. Then I that. fell to sleep. The next morning I was in Johannesburg. I wasn't getting off a shock, or was it like? There were people waiting for me. Yeah. The combi took me to Pretoria. And I was there. And Maybe. your first impressions of South Africa, what did you think? It was hot. Oh, hot. I left in winter, and this was the like, you know, what, February. So, it was hot. And a red salt in Pretoria, and jacaranda cheese, you know. The only cool place was the ice rink. There was oceans with the ice rink on the corner. I don't know if it exists, so small little round ice rink. And the show we started was a mother goose. Well, did you, yeah. like, almost immediately jump into the shows? Was it like... Yeah. Yeah, I quickly learned a few numbers that I can start working. And then become sick. You know, the change with the weather, I had a flu. Uh, and I was sad. And I was, and I just wanted to go back home. I, I don't care what they do to me. I just want to go back 
Oh, that's not my mother. <laughs> <laughs> I had some few nice pieces of jewelry I bought in Persia when we were there. I sold everything and I had enough money for tickets. And I was going to go home. There was a friend who became like a very good friend who did our music covers, Lenny Taylor. He's also somewhere up there by now. And he would come every night because I couldn't skate. He would come every night to the room, Hotel La Monte up the street, brought me something to eat, and I would sit next to my bed and talk to me in language I didn't understand, but I felt that he means it well, you know. Was, was this language English or yeah, French? Yeah, I can't remember if he spoke just English, spoke, okay. English. He was a friend? I could feel it, that it, 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 it's a good vibe. Yeah, we could, yeah, and the flu stopped, then I started to skate again, and I could say hello and goodbye, and how are you, you know, and all that. And slowly with the language, I just settled in. Six months later, renew my visa for another six months, and again another six months for five years. And after five years, I was entitled to permanent residence. Yes. I think, you know, what we're going to do is, I want to split this podcast in two. Yeah. And I think this could be the first part. You arrived in South Africa, you made your first shows, you learn the language a little bit and you got your residence part. Yeah. So, can we continue with the South Africa part in the next show? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I don't want to make it That's, too long. This is like nice ending. This is a nice ending. So, we're almost at an hour. Thank you for listening. Once again, please support me. Um, tune in to the next part two of a sec to sec. It's got an amazing, interesting story. This was for me. It was very entertaining. I think people are really going to like this.